Good evening, brothers and sisters in the faith. Welcome to another episode of the BQ80 Bible Questions and Answers. And tonight, our topic will be about the New Age beliefs, New Age thinking, New Age ideology. And we will test using scriptures whether or not they are compatible with our faith. But before we proceed, we ask everyone to please stand for our opening prayer. Everlasting Father, merciful and gracious God, Yahuwah, Thank you so much for blessing us with this opportunity to be able to stand before your presence, to be able to proclaim your holy words, that your light might shine through the darkness and people be enlightened by that truth, the truth that will set us free and bring us close into fellowship with you. May you please, Father, forgive our sins because we know our sins hinders us from our relationship with you. Loving Abba, may you graciously forgive us once again, and may you pour your spirit upon us all. Our King Yahushua, you are our Mashiach. You are the Christ. May you please be with us in this sacred assembly as we study together and receive wisdom from the scriptures gifted to us by the Father. Father, we believe that you have listened to our prayers. You will be with us in our study this evening, for we ask and beg all things, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen. All right. Praise the speak to our loving Father that we are able to gather once again to study his words and his commands. And our topic for tonight is somewhat related to the topic that we introduced from our last episode of the Bible History Project, namely the New Age Movement, New Age Beliefs, which probably is familiar with many of our viewers today, but maybe they don't understand fully whether or not it is compatible with our faith. So we have to be careful because there's so much information in the world today that sound really good and sound really helpful. But when you look at the root, when you look at what it's actually teaching, it contradicts our faith and the Holy Scripture. So let's go ahead and take a look at the question we're going to be answering for tonight's study. Uh, dear Brother John, uh, thank you for reminding us about the dangers of New Age thinking. I can see how dangerous this movement can be for the people of God. You briefly touched on Eckhart Tolle and the spiritual beliefs that he is preaching. I have many friends who believe in the law of attraction and the book that is entitled The Secret. I am not sure if they are contrary to our faith or not. Can you please clarify? What New Age beliefs should we be aware of and be cautious about? And so this is going to be the topic of our lesson. We're going to look at New Age beliefs, New Age thinking, and look at the law of attraction and the secret and use scriptures to test and see whether or not they are compatible with our faith. And so let's go ahead and begin by addressing the question, you know, what are New Age beliefs how can we know if they contradict scripture in the first place? Well, New Age thinking, New Age philosophy actually had its beginnings in the 1970s and the 1980s, beginning with a book entitled The New Age Politics, Healing Self and Society. So it's an attempt to articulate a new political philosophy based on the movements that began to arise after the new left faded away in the 1970s, especially the feminist, the ecology, spiritual, the centralist, and world order movements. So people in the 1970s, they became disgruntled with how government is taking care of its citizens. And so people began to think about a new way of thinking, new philosophy, so they can create a better world. And so it's all about healing self and healing society and its foundation are the ideas of the feminist movement, ecology, spiritual, decentralism, world order movements. And so what is it all about? We're from this website, allaboutworldview.org, according to New Age Politics, humanity is evolving toward a collective consciousness that will transcend all material and individual boundaries, including national and political boundaries. World government is a natural evolutionary step in this dissolution of boundaries. The new age desire for global government is based less on political theory than on the concept that all is one and that evolution and other scientific principles are leading humanity into global unity. World government 
has the potential to remove barriers and limits and is thus important for cosmic humanists. Since cosmic humanists think in terms of understanding the world as a whole instead of the parts, the next pattern to emerge is global civilization, a unity that will demand a one world government. And so we can see new, the, the new age politics, a new age movement, new age thinking is politically driven. And oftentimes if something is politically driven, the one behind it always are satanic forces. And so we can conclude, we can surmise that behind the new world or new age movement, new age thinking is the devil himself. And we're going to look at that later on as we conclude our studies for today. But according to this website, new age is all about uniting people, right? It's about removing those boundaries that separate individuals from each other, countries from each other to establish a one world government. When you think of a one world government, you think automatically of what the devil wants to do in the end times. And so we can see a connection already between the agendas of the new world movement and the agenda of the antichrist that we've been studying in our lessons uh, recently. And so we have to be alarmed, we have to be concerned because it's going to present the ideas, the new age ideas in such a way to make people say, you know what, that's what we need. We want people to get together, right? We want people to be united because when people are united, they have one world government. We're going to have lasting peace. We're going to have finally what we call utopia here on earth, a heaven here on earth. And so that's really what is the driving force behind the new age movement. It was popularized, however, by an individual named Shirley MacLaine. How many here are familiar with Shirley MacLaine? She wrote two books, which became very popular. One is Out on a Limb, and the other is Dancing in the Light. And it's about popularizing the New Age movement. Shirley MacLaine's book, Out, Out on a Limb, chronicles her reluctant conversion uh, to New Age belief. This book describes her travels and studies, which includes science fiction like Dimensions, out-of-body travel, contact with extraterrestrial beings, trans-channeling seances, and a guided tour of the unseen world. McLean's second book, Dancing in the Light, tells about her reach into the world of yoga, reincarnation, crystal power, Hindu mantras, and past life recall experiences mediated through ac acupuncture. Her spirit guides, her spirit guides, informed her that each individual is God, and she passed along the wisdom that the person is unlimited. One only has to realize it. And so the person who became credited with really popularizing this idea of new age thinking, new age beliefs, was Shirley MacLaine. And she basically underscored that every individual has unlimited potential. I think many of us uh, can relate to that saying because we've been bombarded with that information. You, are, you have unlimited potential as a human being because God is in you. In fact, you are in fact God. And that's the message. Essentially, we can bottom line it. The message of the new age uh, movement is that you yourself are God. And if you are God, guess what? You have unlimited potential potential. You're only hindered because you don't realize that you are God. So when you open your eyes and become enlightened and you begin to realize, you know what, I am God, all of a sudden the sky is the limit. Unlimited potential potential because God, after all, is unlimited. So that's where it's headed, this idea that every individual human being are themselves gods. They have the God potential and they have the potential to do unlimited Things. And so a Christian author, you know, when this became more and more popular and more and more, more, more and more Christians and Bible believing people began to adopt the ideas of new age thinking because new age thinking is often uh, portrayed and communicated using biblical principles. And so there were many people who were convinced that the Bible and new age thinking or new age philosophy were compatible. And so a Christian author by the name of Neil Anderson look closely at the New Age movement. And from his book, Walking Through the Darkness, the New Age movement is not seen as a religion, 
but a new way to think and understand reality. It's very attractive. People like the message of the new age. It's very attractive to the natural man who has been disillusioned with organized religion. This is why when many things were happening all across America and even throughout the world, when religions and organized Christianity were taking advantage of people because of the finances, the oppression, the control. So people began to step out of formal religions. They became disgruntled and all of a sudden this became the opportunity for the devil to present something that is desirable to every individual, right? And that was the new age movement. He desires, human being have, has an innate desire uh, for spiritual reality, but doesn't want to give up materialism, deal with his moral problems, or come under authority. So as human beings, we are spiritual creatures. There's a natural longing in us to long for something or so, to long for someone greater than ourselves. And that, of course, is our father, Yahuwah. But human beings, because of their flesh, well, they don't want to give up material things. They don't want to give up uh, their pet sins or their, their uh, moral problems. And they don't want to be under the authority of God who tells them what to do. And so here comes new age. They get to keep their spirituality and at the same time, you know, keep their materialism because new age thinking tells you you can have all this wealth, all this material things when you think about it, because after all, you yourself are God and they don't have to go under someone else's authority. So this was a perfect mixture at the perfect time for it to blossom. And that's exactly what happened. So according to Dr. Neil Anderson, there are basically six pillars. There are six pillars that undergird new age philosophy, new age thinking. What are they? Let's go to the six pillars of new age belief. Number one, history is not the story of humanity's fall into sin and its restoration by God's saving grace. Rather, it is humanity's fall into ignorance and the gradual descent into enlightenment. This is one of the uh, pillars of the New Age philosophy. They believe that humanity, there was no fall at all. Instead, there is this ignorance and the purpose of life is to achieve enlightenment. And so what's blocking an individual from achieving this enlightenment are, is religion. And so they kind of want to blame God about the reason why they themselves cannot be God. There's only one God, the Bible tells us. And so for me to become also God, that would be a, a sin. And so let's go ahead and take a look at this first part, which is an important part, the idea that human beings are not a fallen race, that we are not fallen. Instead, we are just not enlightened. And so once we're enlightened, then we're going to be able to see our own God nature. And so this all started, I mean, this is against scripture. And the reason why is because Genesis 3, 1 to 3 tells us, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals Yahuwah God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. And so according to scriptures, human beings, Adam and Eve were created and they were given a paradise to live in. It's called the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, there was plenty of trees, there was plenty of things to eat and they were assigned to basically cultivate the garden and to multiply and have and take dominion over the earth. However, Yahuwah God said, you know, you can eat freely from all the trees except for the one in the middle, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that tree because when you eat from that tree, when you eat its forbidden fruit, what's going to happen to you? You're going to die. And so here comes Satan. What does Satan do? Well, he begins to deceive Adam and Eve, especially Eve. What did he say to Eve? He said, she said to Eve, did God really say you must not eat from any tree 
in the garden? You know, that question was a loaded question because it assumes that Yahuwah God told Adam and Eve that they're not to eat from any of the trees. And so he was trying to make Yahuwah God appear to become someone who was not interested in their happiness, in their well-being. You know, God is not interested in your well-being, but I am. And so it's not true that if you eat from the forbidden fr fruit, you will die. And this is what the lie is all about in 4 to 6. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Notice what the devil, the, ed, the enemy was providing Adam and Eve. What was his, what made the temptation enticing? The Bible says, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Isn't that the messaging of new age philosophy? What is promised here? by the serpent when you eat of the forbidden fruit your eyes will be open you'll be enlightened and when you're enlightened you will realize you are what god and so that's the messaging of the new age philosophy and we can find its genesis not from god so it's contrary to god right but from the enemy or adversary of god that kind of idea that when you achieve enlightenment, it makes you become like God, is against the will of God, and it's the cause of the fall. So the Bible says there is a fall. And by Yahuwah's grace, he, is, he initiated the work of redemption and restoration. But according to New Age thinkers, you don't need that. Because humankind never fell. He just needs to open his eyes and realize his own Godhood. And so we can see there's a big rift. There's a big in incompatibility between New Age beliefs and the Holy Scriptures. So let's go look at number two. Number two says, all is God. If all is one, including God, then one must conclude that all is God. It is pantheism. We talked about this before. Trees, snails, books, and people are all one divine essence. A personal God who, was, who has revealed himself in the Bible and in Yahusha is completely rejected. Since God is impersonal, the new ager doesn't have to serve him. God is an it, not a he. This is why new agers call you know, this idea of God as universe. Have you heard that before? I'm going to ask the universe. I'm going to pray to the universe about this and about that because of this idea that all of us are of the same essence. We are all made of the same stuff, which is God stuff. Snails and books and creatures and animals and dogs and cats. We're all connected because we're all God stuff. And we just don't realize that because we're being blinded by our physical nature. And so once we open our eyes and truly see, we're going to realize, you know what? We're all connected. We're all gods. It's called pantheism. So according to pantheism, there's no difference between creator and created. All of us are creators. All of us are God. And so that's the idea of pantheism. This is why it doesn't make sense to think of God as a personal God, because all of us are in this category called God, right? It's kind of weird stuff but many people like to buy it and believe it. However, is this what the Bible teaches? That he is some kind of impersonal being or that he is himself a created being, that we who are his creation are also creators. That is, that is, of, course, not a, that is of course, against the teachings of the Holy Bible. In the book of Deuteronomy, which is the Shema, Yahuwah God says here, O Israel, Yahuwah our God, Yahuwah is one. Love Yahuwah your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So two things we need to understand here. The Bible, the Bible gives a name to God. The fact that God has a name means he's a personal being. His name is what? 
Yahuwah, right? So Yahuwah is God, is a personal being, not an impersonal force. He's not the universe. He created the universe, right? He's not human beings. He created human beings. That's what it means for Yahuwah to be God. And the Bible also says, love Yahuwah your God. And so if Yahuwah is to be loved, if God is to be loved, what does that tell you? I mean, when you say love Yahuwah your God, it's talking about a relationship. And that's what we find throughout the scriptures. The scriptures tells us that human beings were created for relationship of knowing God. Yeah, that's the purpose of creation, which is why Yahuwah is a personal God. He's not some kind of impersonal force. And so in the first commandment, Deuteronomy 5, 6 to 7, I am your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So this is the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. It's very fundamental, but it's what's going to be attacked by the devil. Yahuwah says, I am your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And so how do people disobey this command of Yahuwah God? Well, there are people who end up bowing to images and statues and created things like money, right? But there's a more sophisticated way that the devil has caused people to disobey this command. What is that? Pantheism. This idea that you yourself are also God. And so by doing that, when people adopt that kind of thinking, they break the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Why don't we believe in pantheism? Bible says, even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, and even though there are many of these gods and lords, yet there is for us, for the true followers of, of Yahushua, only one God, the Father, who is the creator of all things, and for whom we live, and there is only one Lord, Yahushua Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. And so it's very clear there's a distinction between the creator and what was created. Who is the creator of all things? The Father. The Father, right? He created all things, Father Yahuwah. And so when we begin to believe that there is, that all of us are gods, co creators with the Father, that we ourselves are part of what is considered God in the pantheistic thinking of things, then we betray this teaching of the Holy Scriptures. In Romans 1, 22 to 25, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Here in this passage of the Apostle Paul, he debunks New Age philosophy. As a matter of fact, New Age philosophy is related to idolatry. The Apostle Paul said, um, people who claim to be wise, and there are many people today who claim to be wise, right? They claim to be enlightened, just like Eckhart Tolle, who claims to have more enlightenment than Yahusha, right? And so many people claim enlightenment. And after achieving enlightenment, all of a sudden they say, you know what? We are not created. We are creators. That's the lie. And that lie started where? The Garden of Eden. Apostle Paul is exposing that lie. Because that lie has many different variations. One variation of that lie is you can worship created things like statues and images, right? But as human beings became more sophisticated in their thinking, they discovered quantum mechanics, they began to meditate, right? And the devil begins to influence their thinking. And so they think they're becoming, they're becoming more and more wise. This lie that you worship the creature rather than the creator developed into something more sophisticated. It's called pantheism, new age beliefs. But Apostle Paul reveals it right here. They traded the truth about God for a lie. 
That's what new age believers want us to do, to trade the truth about God so that we ourselves can be God and do whatever we want. And that's really what human beings want, right? They don't want God who tells them what to do. They want to do whatever they want. That's the kind of packaging that the new age philosophy is being delivered to us nowadays. This is why it's so acceptable and so popular, especially during our time. But you notice that kind of, it's still idolatry. Pantheism is idolatry, right? New age is idolatry. It's the same idolatry and it's the same result. What's the result of this kind of thinking? When you begin to worship the creator or the you worship the creature rather than the creator. The Bible says they begin to abandon, God abandons them to do whatever they want. And so they begin to do shameful things that their hearts desire. I mean, take a look at what's happening in society today, right? I mean, if you say, well, what's your gender? Before it was easy, male or female. Now what do we have? Oh, you have, I don't even know, the different kinds of categories people have nowadays. You get to choose your own gender now. You can be born male, but if you think about, if you really think that you are female, oh, I'm a female, right? Homosexual marriage is becoming a norm. And so what we find nowadays are the things that Yahuwah God prohibited long ago to becoming more mainstream, acceptable, and it's applauded by society to the point that if you criticize it, they will attack you. They will attack you, right? This is society today. The root cause, they rejected who the true God is, and they assume that they themselves are like God. That's just sophisticated sounding idolatry. Idolatry nonetheless, right? And so that's uh, another incompatibility between New Age and the Holy Scriptures. Number three, uh, there was a change in consciousness. If we are God, we need to know we are God. We must become cosmically conscious, enlightened, or attuned to the cosmic consciousness. And so there's a lot of talk about cosmic consciousness, which is this idea that if you think hard enough and meditate hard enough, and you train yourself into believing and thinking, that all of us are connected to this consciousness from the cosmos or the universal consciousness, then when we tap into that energy, it opens our eyes and we begin to realize that we ourselves are gods. That's the cosmic consciousness you're talking about. And the Bible, does the Bible speak about enlightenment? Yeah, but it's not the enlightenment that leads us to conclude that we are also gods. No, what is the enlightenment that the Bible preaches about, and how can we attain this enlightenment? Let's read the book of Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. But it was to us that God made known his secret by means of his spirit. The spirit searches everything, even the hidden depths of God's purposes. It is only our own spirit within us that knows all about us. In the same way, only God's spirit knows all about God. We have not received this world's spirit. Instead, we have received the spirit sent by God so that we may know all that God has given us. And so what is the enlightenment that the Bible speaks of? It is the enlightenment of knowing God's purposes, God's will. The enlightenment that causes you to believe that you are your own God, that's not the purpose of God. The purpose of God is for us to understand his ways so that we can submit to his ways and to his will. But who are able to obtain this kind of understanding? Bible says those who receive the spirit. This is why no matter how much meditation you do, no matter how much books you read, if Yahuwah God does not give you the spirit, you're not going to achieve this kind of enlightenment. But the world it has its own spirit. That's why Apostle Paul says we have not received this world's spirit. You know, the world has a so-called God ruling it, right? Who is that, who is that so-called God ruling it? The devil. He rules it together with his minions. And the ruling spirits, these spirits that influences nations, influences people, influences the generation of ideas. That's the spirit that dwells in the world. And it's contrary to the spirit of God. 
And so the world spirit, it brings the enlightenment that people want to hear, which is you are God. You have unlimited potential. And so we have to be careful. The only way for us to understand the deep purpose of God is by receiving the spirit of God, not the spirit of this world. And what is the spirit of God all about? Let's read the book of uh, Corinthians as well. So then we do not speak in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, as we explain spiritual truths to those who have the spirit. Whoever does not have the spirit cannot receive the gifts that come from God's spirit. Such a person really does not understand them. And they seem to be nonsense because their value can be judged only on a spiritual basis. And so what can we expect when we reject the wisdom of the world? Because what we receive is the spirit of God. We can expect that people will not understand us. People will mock scriptural truths. And this is what we see in the world today. People say the Bible is old-fashioned, right? The Bible is only man-made stories. And so they replace the Bible with the world's wisdom, which is sophisticated, they say, because it tells you, you yourself is God. And so that's nonsense. But to them who do not have the spirit of Yahuwah, the Bible says they think what we preach is nonsense. What does that tell you? There is this rift between New Age ideas and the Bible. This is why even though New Age believers say we believe in the Bible and it's compatible with the Bible, don't believe that. It's not. It's not compatible with the Bible. Okay? Because the Bible says New Age things is nonsense. The New Age people say the Bible is nonsense. So there's this incompatibility between the two. And those who receive the Spirit, what kind of mind will they have? Let's read Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. Whoever has the Spirit, however, is able to judge the value of everything, but no one is able to judge him. As the Scripture says, who knows the mind of the Lord, who is able to give him advice? We, however, have the mind of Christ. When we, when we receive the Spirit, and by that Spirit, we understand the Scriptures of Yahuwah, we begin to develop the mind of Christ, not the so-called cosmic consciousness, but the mind of Christ. That's the mind we are to put on, not the mind of New Age beliefs, not the mind of the world, not the mind of the enemy or the adversary, but the mind of Christ. And how can we receive the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit? And so the enlightenment that is from the Bible makes us think like who? Yahusha. And Yahusha will never say we are all gods. Right? Yahusha even said, do not call me good. There's only one good who is that? The Father. He will never say things like you are all gods. We are all gods. Kumbaya. Praise the Lord. Right? No, that's not the, that's not the teaching of our King Yahusha. He says the Father is the only true God. All right? Let's go to number four. A cosmic evolutionary optimism is, is taught there is a new age coming. There will be a new world order, a new world government. New age thinkers believe that there will eventually be a progressive unification of world consciousness. And so the goal of new age is this. Human beings, one by one, they develop this consciousness. They begin to realize their unlimited potential. And as they do that, as they grow into their own Godhead, they begin to work together. They begin to realize, you know, we're working on, we're working, we can work together now because we have the same consciousness, because we're all connected. We can build a better world. So you have a one, and so it's, 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 it's based on this idea of optimism that the world will become a better place without the help of the biblical God. Just their own power alone, because after all, they're also gods. And so once they realize that, they can create a new world. And Eckhart Tolle calls it a new earth, right? And Eckhart Tolle was also working with Oprah Winfrey. You see Oprah right there. And they both share the same ideology, which is new age. Oprah Winfrey is a promoter of new age ideas and new age beliefs. And Eckhart Tolle um, is one of her, I guess, one of her favorites. Yeah, 
Eckhart Tolle and sort of working on a church together. And it's the church that will cause people to realize their own Godhead, become evolved, and create a new earth together. And so what is Eckhart Tolle's philosophy? His teachings focus on the significance and power of presence. And the, when he speaks of presence, it is the realization of who you truly are, that you are God. The awakened state of consciousness. So that's the next step towards evolution. And so Eckhart believes in evolution, but the evolution that he promotes is not just the physical evolution, but eventually the transcendence into godhood, okay? And so can, according to God questions, when they review this book, A New Earth, consider what we found in just the, in just the, the pages of the first chapter, okay? This is what they conclude. Evolution of life over millions of years is accepted, assumed, and understood to be fact. Christ is often used. They, they quote Christ, but it's misquoted. Flowers, crystals, precious stones, and birds are believed to be temporary manifestations of the universal consciousness and are themselves considered enlightened life forms. The definition of sin is misinterpreted. They say it's an illusion. There's no such thing as sin. How many here like that idea? You can do whatever you want. It's not sin. Christ is thought of as just one of the rare people who, like the Buddha, achieved divine consciousness. Other religions, such as Buddhism, are considered just as valid and true as Christianity. An early Christian cult, Gnosticism, is portrayed as one of the few groups who actually understood the teachings of Christ. Original, original sin was simply a forgetting of the connectedness and oneness with the source. The source, along with everything else connected with the source, a delusion of separateness, heaven is portrayed as merely an inner realm of consciousness. And so according to Eckhart Tolle, when we enter this inner realm of consciousness and we realize our connectedness to each other and the source and that we are all God, then we can begin to work together and create a new earth. And so according to Eckhart Tolle, the new earth, the new, the golden age of the earth is not something Yahuwah gives us, something we create for ourselves. When we are able to see each other for who we truly are as gods, then we can work together, be united, and create a city for ourselves, the new earth. Does that sound familiar to you? Does that sound familiar? Unity, building a tower, a city for ourselves. Does that sound familiar? In the book of Genesis, this was after the flood. Yahuwah tells the people to spread, to spread throughout the world, right? After the flood, what did the people do? They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And so when human beings were instructed by Yahuwah to spread across the whole earth, instead of abiding to the teaching, the direct command of Yahuwah, what did they do? They defied Yahuwah. That's human nature. We don't like to be told what to do for some reason, right? And so instead of spreading throughout the world, what do they want to do? To make a name for themselves. Instead of worshiping and glorifying Yahuwah as God, they wanted to promote themselves. They wanted to elevate themselves, to make a name for themselves. And so what did they decide to do? They talked to each other because they were united, right? And they said, you know what? Let's build a power instead. Let's make our own city. Instead of doing what God wants us to do, let's make our own city. And if he decides to send another flood, so what? We have a tower. We can just go to that tower. And so they defied Yahuwah God, right? And so when Yahuwah was looking at them, what, what did he decide to do? In Genesis 11, 5 to 9, but Yahuwah came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, Yahuwah scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. 
That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where Yahuwah confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. And so when Yahuwah saw the people were united because they had the same language, in other words, they were thinking the same way, and they were building a tower in the city instead of doing what Yahuwah wants, Yahuwah, he went down and he confused them, right? This is why people, this is why we have the Tower of Babel, and it's called Babel because all of a sudden they could no longer understand each other. This caused them to spread out throughout the world. However, in the end times, guess who's uniting them again? <laughs> who's uniting them again? The devil. The devil's giving them one language. What is that? The language of the new age. For what purpose? To build a tower, to build a city for themselves, right? This is why many people believe today we don't need the help of God. We, when we realize our own godhood, we can create our new kingdom. We can create our own utopia. But the Bible says no. The kingdom wherein we will find complete joy and happiness is not something that we human beings can put together. This is why no matter how many um, peace talks we have, people still war against each other, right? No matter how many times we try to unite the nations, there's a lot of war. There's a lot of war going on right now. It's something we cannot do on our own. In fact, how and only when will we find a true kingdom filled with joy? In the book of Revelation, uh, then the seventh angel sounded. And there, was, there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and Ever. The Bible says that there's going to be a change in kingdoms. What will happen to the kingdoms of this world is going to be removed and given over to Yahuwah and Yahusha. And the 24 elders who sat before God on the thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Yahuwah God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And the time of the time of the dead, and they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So the Bible, the Bible tells us there's no unification of the nations that will result in a kingdom that will last forever. The Bible tells us these nations and kingdoms will be destroyed. And there's going to be one kingdom that will last forever, right? The one led by our king, Yahusha, as appointed by Yahuwah, who is almighty. And this is why the idea that we get to create our own kingdom that will be filled with joy, that is not the message of the Holy Bible. Bible tells us we are to receive this kingdom from Yahuwah through Yahusha. In Isaiah 65, 18 and 25. Bible says, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Who's going to create it? Is it us human beings? No, it's going to be Yahuwah, right? And in Revelation 21, 1 to 4, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no mercy. Then I just saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride door for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So according to Eckhart Tolle, verse 4, right? An age... A world, an earth, where there will be no more tears, there's no more death or sorrow or crying, that can be achieved. That can be achieved here on earth. When there's this universal consciousness, when we begin to realize we are all gods and we can all work together to create this new age, this new world. But the Bible says, no, this heaven and this earth is going to pass away. It's not going to last forever. It's going to pass away. And once it passes away, there's going to be a new earth and a new heaven. And from that new earth and new heaven is the holy city. It's going to come down from God. 
It's not created by us. It's from Yahuwah. And once that is installed, the Bible says it's like Yahuwah tabernacled with men. And then the result will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain. And so Yahuwah gives that. We don't make it ourselves. We don't create that society. We are incapable of doing that. But Yahuwah God is able to give that to us. Okay. Number five, new agers create their own reality. They believe they can create reality by what they believe. And by changing what they believe, they can change reality. All moral boundaries have been erased. There are no absolutes because there is no distinction between good and evil. And so as a human being, a sentient being, they believe that, well, because you have consciousness and we're all parts of that universal consciousness, you get to create your own reality. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, who is the one who creates things? Isn't it Yahuwah God? Yahuwah God created the heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yahuwah created all things in the beginning. But new age people tell you, you too can create things and you can change and manipulate reality. So if you think hard enough, the electrons, the protons, the muons, whatever sub subatomic particle is there in reality, begins to change. When you think about it hard enough, you begin to change the energy of vibration of the universe. And so they like to talk about vibration. They like, they like to talk about energy. Everything has energy. You have energy. The universe has energy. When you vibrate the same frequency, you begin to influence it, right? And so they have a lot of this sophisticated sounding kind of uh, ideas that apparently, according to them, can be tested, but no physicist will tell you that this is all legit. It's all mumbo jumbo, according to them, which is true, you know? And so, nevertheless, they believe that with the power of thought, you can change and alter reality. This is why it's a good time to segue to the question that we talked about earlier. I have many friends who believe in the law of attraction in the book that is entitled The Secret. I am not sure if they are contrary to our faith or not. And so for those who are not aware, there's a book that is really, really popular now. It's called The Secret. And they even made it into a Netflix movie, which became very, very popular. And many people buy into the ideas presented by the secret, which is, of course, a new age teaching. What is the secret all about? Well, this is what you get from the introduction to the book. In this book, you'll learn how to use the secret in every aspect of your life. Money, health, relationships, happiness, and in every interaction you have in the world. And so the secret is all about abundance. You will have an abundance of money, an abundance of health, an abundance of good relationships, an abundance of happiness all by your thought. And so when you hear things like that, what do you say? I want that, right? I want that. And so you begin to read it. I want to be just like these people who have achieved abundance of money and health and relationships and happiness. You'll begin to understand the hidden, untapped power that's within you. And this revelation can bring joy to every aspect of your life. The secret contains wisdom from modern day teachers, men and women who have used it to achieve health, wealth, and happiness by applying the knowledge of the secret. They bring to light compelling stories of eradicating disease, acquiring massive wealth, overcoming obstacles, and achieving what many would regard as impossible. And it's unfortunate, the, the, the so-called prosperity gospel, which is popular today, right? the prosperity gospel, it's in alignment with the ideas presented by the secret. And more and more people who call themselves Christians, they're adopting the ideologies presented by the secret because they say it is according to biblical principles. This is why the prosperity gospel and the secret kind of go hand in hand, right? And one of the reasons why this became very, very popular is because of that lady once again. Her name is Oprah, right? Because she's really a new agent. She's a new age thinker. And so she sponsored shows to promote the secret and according to oprah winfrey the, uh, the the secret is really the law of attraction right because the question is you know what's the law of attraction all about well that's the secret what's the secret the law of attraction but there's a deeper secret underneath the law of attraction we're going to share that with you uh, later on but what is this law of attraction well the foundation of the secret is the law of attraction an impersonal force 
that individuals, take note, can manipulate with their thoughts, with their thoughts, in order to achieve what they want in their lives. It is, writes Byrne, the author of The Secret, the law that determines the complete order in the universe. Every moment of your life and every single thing you experience in your life, the law of attraction is forming your entire life experience. And this all powerful law is doing that through your thoughts. The secret of the law of attraction has supposedly been known throughout the centuries by numerous individuals like Socrates and Plato and Newton and Beethoven and Einstein and religion such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Hermetic traditions. And so the author of uh, The Secret is basically claiming she has the theory of everything, right? That everything that has been accomplished by humans, including all the different religions, which by the way, includes Christianity and includes what they, whom they call Jesus, all of that is the product of applying the secret, which is what? The law of attraction. What is the law of attraction about? When you think it manipulates and changes reality. And so what you think about can change the physical universe. That's the power that you have. That's a secret, okay? Don't let anyone know. That's the secret she wants to share. That if you have this power, you can basically do whatever you want with it, right? And some of the quotes that you get from the book are, you know, what I want to share with you here. We are all connected and we are all part of the one energy field or one supreme mind or the one consciousness or the one creative source. We are all one. She goes on to say, you are God in a physical body. You are spirit in the flesh. You are eternal life expressing itself as you. You are a cosmic being. You are all power. You are all wisdom. You are all intelligence. You are perfection. You are magnificence. You are the creator. And you are the creating, the creation of you on this planet. That means you have God potential and power to create your world. Amazing. When people read this stuff, they like it. You know, they consume it. Byrne explains one implement, how one implements the law of attraction. So how do you apply the law of attraction, right? And this is where it gets interesting. This is where a lot of people believe that the Bible and New Age belief, they, they, they are compatible with each other. Okay, this is according to Byrne. The creative process used in the secret, which was taken from the New Testament in the Bible. And so when you're reading the secret, wait a minute, this is from the Bible, right? This is from the Bible. And this is what she says is the foundation of the secret. And she says it's in the Bible, right? The secret, which was taken from the New Testament in the Bible, is an easy guideline for you to create what you want in three simple steps. So you can create your own, your own world in three simple steps. What are the steps? First step is ask. Second step is believe. Step three is receive. Ask, believe, receive, and then they quote Matthew 21 verse. 22. You ask, you believe, voila, you receive. Three steps. The ask, uh, the ask step is really a command to the impersonal universe. Wait a minute. Some, you, you, you see what she did? She started off with biblical premise. Ask, believe, receive. And then switches. When you ask, you don't ask from God. <laughs> you ask from somewhere else. You ask from the universe. This is why more and more people today are saying, you know, I'm going to ask the universe. Oh, the universe gave me this. The universe gave me that. Oh, the universe was kind enough for me to be at that right spot at that right time to get that perfect job for myself. The universe connected me to you. Therefore, I have to marry you. <laughs> so the universe is taking the place of God. And the universe happens to be you, and you, and you, and me. We're all the universe. Pantheism, okay? So what's the first step? The ask step is really a command to the impersonal universe, which is likened to the story of Aladdin and the lamp. Simply ask the genie 
for what you want and you place an order to the universe. That's the first step. The second step involves belief, which according to Nichols, one of the commentators, involves unwavering faith, although faith in what is never clarified. It's really a faith in faith, faith in your own godhood, right? Byrne claims you must believe that you must believe that you have received. Continuing with the genie illustration, Byrne adds, the genie or the universe is responding to your predominant thoughts all the time. That's why after you've asked, you must continue to believe and know. Have faith. You believe that you have it. It is your greatest power. And the third step, finally, sit back, feel good, and receive what the law of attraction delivers. So what the law of attraction tells you is just if you think of a million dollars, okay? Some people even have visual boards. So you just think of a million dollars every day. You think of a million dollars, a million dollars, a million dollars. Well, the universe is going to be attracted to that. And the universe will do its, will do, will work on getting you that million dollars, okay? So it's like a genie. <laughs> you put out a, a, a request from the universe, and then you become a millionaire. The question is this, of all the millions of people who believe and apply the secret, I wonder how many, <laughs> how many of them actually have everything that they thought about? Because you can put this to the test, right? Brethren, we have to be careful what's being thrown out there. The secret is not biblical, even though they say it is. They even quote Matthew 21, 22. So let's take a look at Matthew 21, 22. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. There it is. You ask, believe, receive, right? But what's the big difference? Well, we have to understand with this passage given to us by Yerusha, we need to see the whole context, right? And the context includes the whole Bible. Because a lot of things you can... People from you know, New Age thinkers like Eckhart Tolle and Byrne, who is the author of The Secret, they like to pick and choose which Bible verse they use. And so they use this, and with the whatever, they think it's a carte blanche, whatever it is that you can think of, anything and everything goes, right? And when you ask in prayer, you're asking from the universe. But that's not what our King Yahushua is saying. With whom do we ask? In Matthew 7, Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks will receive and anyone who seeks will find and the door will be open to those who knock. Would any of you who are fathers give your son a stone when he asks for bread? Or would you give him a snake when he asks for a fish? As bad as you are, you know how to give good things to your children. How much more then will your father in heaven Give good things to those who ask him. And so right here in this passage, it destroys the belief that the secret is portrayed that the passage from Matthew that we read earlier, 2021, is the foundation of the secret. Because here, our King Yahushua tells us, we don't pray to the universe. Who do we pray to? The Father. Right? Not to the universe, the Father. And when our King Yahushua says, whatever you ask, does it mean carte blanche every single thing that we ask for? No. Because our King Yahushua says that the Father knows how to give good things. He's not going to give us something bad. Right? If we're going to ask for something and Yahuwah knows he's going to destroy our life, will he give that to us? You who are parents who are here, would you give something? I mean, if your kid asked you, can I have a machine gun for my birthday? I had all A's. Will your parents give that to you? Would you give that to your kid? Of course not, <laughs> right? The father knows the good gifts to give. This is why when the Bible says, whatever you ask, the father will give. It goes with this understanding. What is that? We have courage in God's presence because we are sure that he hears us if we ask him for anything that is according to his will, he hears us when we ask him. And since we know this is true, we know also that he gives us what we ask from him. And so when the Bible says whatever, right? It doesn't mean whatever in absolute, in the absolute sense. 
but whatever is according to his will. And what's according to the will of Yahuwah? The Bible says it's for our own benefit. What is that benefit? So that we will have the victory, the victory, which is his will. What is that victory? Victory over death, meaning we are going to receive salvation and everlasting life. And what's the proof that Christianity and the true faith is really incompatible with the secret? Romans 8, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. There's this mentality which is being, again, expounded upon by prosperity gospel preachers and including the, the, the secret, right? If you just think about it, you're going to have an abundance of wealth and health and good things coming your way. Look at these early followers of Yahushua. What did they encounter? Trouble, calamity, persecution. They were hungry. They were not rich, right? And so does that mean they were not true Christians? Does that mean that Yahuwah did not listen to their prayers? Does it mean that because they went through all of this, it's because they failed to apply the secret? Because when you think about what they went through, the Bible says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. And so if Apostle Paul was applying the secret, if he was enlightened to apply the secret, then he could have avoided all this. But Apostle Paul went through all of that, right? Why? Because it's part of God's will. Why is it part of God's will? Because it shapes his character so that he can be credible when he preaches the gospel. And what he wants us to know and understand is the overall victory. What is that victory? What does Yahuwah really want to give us? What is that victory? Corinthians 15, 19. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. See, many people, when they seek enlightenment, when they seek worship, what they have in mind is, you know, a perfect life here on earth. The Apostle Paul says, wait a minute, if your hope in Christ is for this life on earth, you are to be the most pitied of all people. Because the victory that Jehovah wants to give us is not for, for this earth only. What is that victory? The victory is when Yahushua returns. That's why Apostle Paul says, since you have been raised in life with Christ, set your sights in the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand, Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. That's the victory. When Yahushua returns, we will share in his glory. That's what Yahuwah wants. That's the gift he wants to give us. And so if there's anything that will ruin that gift, Yahuwah's not going to give it to us. And this is why there are people who you know, they pray for certain things to happen in this earth, but it doesn't happen because it's not the will of Yahuwah. Because Yahuwah, in his infinite wisdom, knows if this is granted to us here on earth, for example, an abundance of wealth, it might cause us to forget about Yahusha and about Yahuwah. And so Apostle Paul tells us and reminds us, you know, our greatest hope in Yahusha is not for this earth. It is for the heavens to come in the heavenly world. That's where the victory that Yahuwah wants us to achieve lies. Not here, but there. And so we need to understand that. And that's the messaging that is contrary to the New Age belief. And lastly, uh, New Agers make contact with the kingdom of darkness, calling a medium a channeler and a demon, a spirit guide, has not changed the reality of what they are. And so New Agers don't believe you know, demons are bad. They're just creatures, they're just uh, spirits who have something to teach us. And so all spiritual beings, demons or angels, they're there to teach us. 
And if you remember Shirley MacLaine's book, one of the things that she, she emphasized was trans-channeling, seances, right? Because when you become a medium and you communicate with spirits, you begin, you are given knowledge of the unseen spiritual world. And people like that idea. But the Bible warns us about that in the book of Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14. When you enter the land, Yahuwah, your God is giving you, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. Okay. That's obvious. We're not going to do that. But there are people who are doing it. And do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to Yahuwah. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that Yahuwah your God will drive them out ahead of you. But you must be blameless before Yahuwah your God. The nations you are about to, dis to displace consult sorcerers and fortune tellers, but Yahuwah your God forbids you to do such things. One of the, one of the uh, pillars of New Age belief is this idea that you can channel spirits, that you can talk to the so-called dead, that you can do fortune telling and use sorcery. But this is precisely what Yahuwah calls detestable. This is why, especially now, you know, the, the world is about to celebrate in October. There's a big birthday, not big birthday, but there's a celebration October 31st, right? What, what do people call that? Halloween. And a lot of people during that time, the what is that called? That board where they supposedly contact and are guided by Ouija board, right? And so according to them, they get some kind of knowledge when they contact spirits. Bible says these are detestable things. And we want to warn the young members of the assembly, the, the, the young people who are here, we have to be careful. You might be saying to yourself, I just want to try it. I want to know if it's true. Why will you dabble into something Yahuwah says not to do? If Yahuwah says it is detestable to him, don't even think of it. Don't even, you know, think about the possibility of experimenting with it. Because these are evil spirits. And Apostle Paul says concerning these evil spirits in Colossians 2, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature has not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels saying they had had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud. And so the Bible tells us, even during the New Testament times, the devil is at work. He's trying to convince us to follow his teachings. The New Age beliefs today are patterned after the teachings of the devil and his spiritual rulers and authorities of this dark world to convince us to engage in occultic practices to engage in mediums and psychics and to even worship angels. This is why there are people today, you know, who believe they have an angel that they worship. And they have special angels and they begin to worship angels. And all of this, according to, to them, is part of the religious movement. But Apostle Paul says, even if you've seen a vision that causes you to worship creatures, it's not from Yahuwah. It's not from our king, Yahusha. And nowadays, do you know what the devil is going to use so that he can have an audience? This is what Apostle Paul says. These people are false apostles. They're deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I'm not surprised even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment for their wicked deeds Deserve. This is why we have to be careful because sometimes there are people who dream and in their dream they saw a figure who's made of light and this figure who's made of light gives them a message, right? 
sometimes, I mean, all the time, we have to test our message because Satan uses and disguises himself as an angel out. Like, what does that mean? He will present himself to you, not as an enemy, but what? As a guide, as a guru, as someone who uh, will help you, just like what he did in the Garden of Eden. And so he will disguise himself, not only in dreams. He will use different ways by which he can disguise himself so that he can present his ideas in a way that can be accepted by the people living today. Because the people living today, they have different thinking compared to the people living 2,000 years ago and 4,000 years ago, right? We have a sophisticated mind today. And so yeah, the devil knows that. And so if he's going to masquerade himself in such a way so that his message will be accepted by the majority of people, he's going to pattern his strategy after what is acceptable today. You notice today, I mean, this year, last year, there's been a heavy uptick. Lots and lots of occurrences of so-called UFOs, right? I mean, even the Pentagon got involved. And more and more people are, I mean, these are recent articles, 2022. And many people are, you know, the, a lot of the UFO phenomena that the Pentagon and other organizations are studying, there are a lot of them have been proven to be, you know, identifiable after all. However, there's some case examples that are beyond explanation. And more and more of these case examples that defy explanation are popping up. This is why many people are thinking there are other creatures in the universe, right? People think, you know, the universe is so large, there has to be some kind of alien life form in the world out there. If an alien came to the earth today, okay, I want you to think of this. If an alien came to earth today and began to preach, would you listen to that alien? You probably will. This alien must know something we don't because after all, he's out of the earth. He transcends the earth. And so when you have a being like that, you have... He has your full attention, doesn't he? Does he not? Right? So we're not surprised. We have these alien abductions. We have these UFO sightings. But is there a connection between UFOs and demonic activity? According to one researcher named by the name of Michael Heiser, he says, yes. You know, Michael Heiser is a Hebrew scholar, a biblical scholar. And at the same time, he studied UFO phenomena for many, many years. And according to his investigation, there's a connection. And what is that connection? Well, I want you to hear for yourself. I'm going to play this video. Let me go ahead and optimize this so that you can. I don't know if it's my optimizer already. Oops. Okay, here it is. In terms of specific examples, as far as contact team messaging that I would view as sinister, you know, something that is spiritual darkness, you know, lurking in the background. Uh, in the history of ufology, there have been a couple of very famous contact team episodes. One of them involved a guy named George Adamski. Uh, Adamski became very famous uh, in the 50s and you know, thereafter uh, for supposedly being contacted by an alien presence, uh, visiting Venus and all these different planets, having this or that vision. I call them visions, but he would actually say he went to these places with his alien friends. And his messaging was really uh, nothing more than warmed over Gnosticism, that the aliens were telling him, oh, the, the, every human has the light of God or the light of you know, the, the supernatural realm. Uh, in them, and they just need to remember sort of who they are. They need to be enlightened. Very typical Gnostic messaging about the salvation of humanity being from within and recognizing their own divinity. Gnostic. Does that sound familiar? Right? Isn't that the new age? And so there's this connection between new age thinking and the message of aliens according to those abducted by aliens. And so he's conducted a lot of research and interviewed a lot of these people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. And the messaging of the aliens is similar to the messaging of New Age. What else? 
And you can see this kind of messaging in a number of Contact T episodes in the history of UFO studies. I think the reason why we get a similarity here or an overlap between alleged ET messaging and Gnosticism is that there is a good part of the whole alien thing, the alien subject matter, that is inherently spiritual. Again, this is a, this is a wide, far-ranging kind of subject, and at least part of it is really about, apparently, spiritual messaging. And who, who's going to be interested in spiritual messaging except spiritual beings? Okay, so you have competitors to God who have their own kind of message to direct humanity away from the truth. And it's very convenient, again, to use a certain set of ideas. But here we are in the 20th century okay, with these contact T events. And so I, I view this part of ufology as really nothing more than intelligent demonic beings using old lies and repackaging them for a 20th and 21st century audience. What to a 20th and 21st century person would be godlike? An extraterrestrial. It's very simple. It's, it's an intelligent being that isn't us. It's not part of the animal kingdom. It's so transcendent when compared to us that it becomes a very convenient vehicle. And if you really think about it, alien messaging, U UFO stuff on that level, is really sort of like converting heaven to space. You have heaven without the God of the Bible. You have a transcendent destiny for humanity without any accountability at all. The, the whole question of sin and salvation isn't even on the table, but yet you get to keep all the good parts. Oh, we have this great destiny. Oh, we're going to become godlike. Oh, the, the deity is interested in us and loves us and has a message for us and picks some of us to convey this message and make us special. You have all of that repackaged in this sort of technological society garb as aliens. Okay. So the messaging of the people who received alien abduction messages and the messaging of the new age, they're the same. And it's basically this, to cause us to find our own way to the heavens, right? You don't need the Christ because you yourself can be your own Christ. And so what the, the, the demons want to do with the new, this messaging that is found in New Age wants to convince us is that we don't need to pay attention to God. We don't need to pay attention to the Bible. We don't need the Christ because there's no such thing as sin. We just need to be enlightened so that we can see our own deity within us. And so that's the messaging of the new age. And this messaging of the new age is really nothing new. It was present in the very beginning. Right? In the Garden of Eden, the serpent says, you're not going to die because New Age belief tells us there's no such thing as death. Death is just, it's temporary. And once you die, you begin to realize you don't actually die. So they believe in reincarnation. You know, they don't believe in death. They say you just need to have your eyes open. You become like God. And this idea of the message of the new age is pleasing to the eyes. And they think it's good for wisdom, right? But that idea came from where? The enemy. Since when? Since the beginning. It's not, not new. New age is not new. It's the same lie that was told in the Garden of Eden in the very beginning. That's repackaged so that it becomes more palpable for human beings today. But it's the same lie. And the one responsible for that lies that serpent mentioned in the Holy Bible. And so we need to become aware of that because the devil wants, he does not want people to obey Yahuwah God. He does not want people to recognize Yahuwah as God. What the devil wants to do is to replace God. And often times throughout the history, that replacement came in the form of images and idols and false gods. But today, it's coming in a new form, pantheism, new age. And so it's not only the statue that is being worshipped, but you yourself have become gods 
instead of believing Yahuwah is the only true God. So New Age belief, it's the idea that you can be independent of God or a part of God. New Age belief tells you you can do whatever you want, have whatever you want, because when you learn to open your eyes, you'll realize that you are also God. And so it's really being independent of God. And you know, when we are celebrating tabernacles, it reminds us that we should not depend on self, right? But we should depend on Yahuwah in providing us everything. We need to always place our trust in Yahuwah. We should never think that we are better or greater than who we, than who we are. We need to always trust Yahuwah because the idea that we can live apart from God that came from the one who deceived Adam and Eve, right? And you know who that was? In Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15, we're almost done. Uh, son of man, uh, sing this funeral song uh, for the king of Tyr. So the king of Tyr was influenced by this being. Give him this message from the sovereign Yahuwah. You were the model of perfection full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone. Red carnelian, pale green peridot, white moonstone, blue green beryl, onyx green jasper, blue lapis lazuli, turquoise, and emerald, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. And so there's this angelic being who was created perfect, beautiful, majestic, exquisite in beauty, model of perfection, full of wisdom, until eventually evil was found in him. And when evil was found in him, right, the Bible mentions he was in the garden of Eden. And so whatever evil that was found in him, that's what he wants to spread. That's the gospel of this fallen angel. And that gospel of the fallen angel is really something that we need to be aware of. What is that? What was the evil that was found in him? Isaiah 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroy the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. And so what is that gospel that the enemy of Yahuwah is presenting? This son of the morning, the shining star. What does he want to present? It is his idea that you don't need to submit to your God. You can rise above God. You can be your own God. It's called pride, right? He sought to be worshipped instead of worshipping God. And that's the messaging that we receive today from all over the internet, from all over Facebook. It's everywhere. People, the devil wants you to forget God. And we're not surprised. We're finding more and more of this messaging all over the world. Why is that? This is the warning of Apostle Paul. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own teachers and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. And so according to Apostle Paul, why are we not surprised that during our time today, the philosophy, the teachings of the new age has reached the minds and has been accepted by so many people, millions of people throughout the world. Apostle Paul says time will come when people will not be interested in whole, in sound and wholesome teaching. What will they be interested in? The Bible says they will look for gurus like Eckhart Tolle and Burr, right? Who will tell them what their itching ears want them to hear? How many here want to listen to a doctrine that says there's no such thing as sin? You like that? <laughs> How about just think about wealth and you'll be wealthy? You like that? How about you yourself are God? You like that? People like it. 
And so they're going to look for gurus. They're going to look for teachers who will teach them what they're itching to hear. Apostle Paul says, we have to be careful. We have to hold on to the truth. And so what does Apostle Paul instruct us to do so that we will not be deceived by these kinds of ideologies? And 4, 1 and 2, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Yahushua, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. And so this is what we do in the BHP, the BQA. We will not, we probably have ruffled some feathers today. I'm sure there are many people who have adopted the ideologies of the New Age movement, perhaps even those who are members of the Assembly of Yahusha, who maybe in the past that know about the roots and what is behind New Age philosophy and thinking. And so we decided to preach this message, even though we might get a lot of enemies and a lot of pushback because of what we did tonight. But Apostle Paul tells us time will come and people will look for teachers right, who are itching, who, who are, will teach them what their ears are itching here. But here in the assembly of Yerusha, we're not going to do that. We're going to teach the truth. Even if it's not what we want to hear. Why? Because it's what we need to hear. What we need to hear is the truth. What we need to hear is what will lead to salvation. And that's the gospel, the word of God. That's what we preach. And so if there's, you know, philosophies, that are out there and they disguise themselves in biblical garb and they are endangering our brethren, we're going to preach the truth. We're going to preach the word of God, patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage people with good teaching. This is what the Assembly of Yahushua is all about. And we will not stop preaching the truth because this is what we were commissioned to do. And so brothers and sisters, you know, if any of us, any of you have subscribed to New Age philosophy and thinking, we encourage all of you to rethink that, to repent, to return to Yahuwah, to Yahusha, and place your trust not in this idea presented by the New Age, but to hold on to the truth of Yahuwah, our loving Abba, because all scripture is good for teaching, rebuke, and correcting so that we can be equipped for, with every good work. You want good to come in our life? Use the scripture. All scripture. Let that be the basis of all our decisions. Let that be the basis of our faith. Let us have a lesson. Let us stand and we shall pray together. Everlasting Father, loving Abba Yahuwah, thank you for giving us your message. We know indeed the end is near. And so the adversary of our faith, they're doing their best to try and derail us. Father, help us to be vigilant, to know what we believe, to understand your words. When we study scripture, all of it, we ask that you please enlighten us through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may know the difference between what is true and what are lies. We know the adversary is adept, very clever, disguising a lie, making it sound like truth. Help us here in the assembly of Yahushua that we will only embrace your truth because we know this truth is what will liberate us that we may be able to be with you forevermore. Our King Yahushua, may you please strengthen our faith. Bless every household, especially the young members among us that they will not be influenced by wickedness, by deceit. Instead, they will stand their ground holding firmly to the truth and always being obedient to you and the Father. Father, please forgive us, replenish our faith and strengthen us once again. And may you pour your spirit in our hearts and in our minds. We ask everything, loving Abba, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, uh, thank you for attending our Bible study for today. Before we go ahead and part ways, we just want to remind everyone, this coming Sunday is our special worship service. We will not have the Friday, Saturday uh, regular service in lieu of the Sunday uh, special worship service, which will be the eighth day of the celebration of Tabernacles. 
And this is October 16th at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time because we will have an in-person gathering. Those who are planning to attend, uh, please let us know that you intend to come so that we can give you the exact location. And for those who are asking, yes, it is potluck if you want to prepare a special dish that you want us to taste. Uh, with no judgment, uh, please go ahead and share uh, whatever you want to share with us. And that's 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. This will be in Northern California. Also, we have our Bible study schedule, the BQA and the BHPs. Same, same regular schedule for this week. So we have the BHP this coming Thursday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you have any questions, please submit them to ministry at assemblyofyahusha.org. Also, if you have the time, we strongly encourage everyone to go to Vimeo and type in Assembly of Yahusha, and then please download the videos that we have here. Uh, for you to download, I believe you have to become, uh, you have to set up an account with Vimeo, but it's free, okay? So you set up a free account. Afterwards, you can download the videos that we have here in Vimeo. That is all. Yehovah Abba and Yahusha HaMashiach bless all of us.